Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Baker. Councillor Campbell. Here. Councillor Siomo. Present. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Sabi George. Yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councillor McCarthy. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Presley. Councillor Presley. <laughs> Councillor Wu. And Councillor Zakem. Madam President, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. I am informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. At this time, would all my colleagues and all guests please rise <coughs> as um, our clerk comes up to lead us in the invocation. After she finishes, I ask that everyone remain standing as um, she takes us through the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk. <laughs> thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. Blessed are the just for they have their reward in indestructible integrity. Blessed are though they who labor in the vineyards of public realm, for they shall be remembered. Blessed are they who love their nation enough to praise its strengths and criticize its weaknesses, for they shall be made wise. Blessed are public officials who are responsive to the needs of these, the least of the people, for they shall be deputies of the community. Blessed are they who serve the public good, for their reward is in being used. Blessed are the powerful who acknowledge their power as both gift and responsibility for they know the binding obligations of their bounty. Blessed are they who rebuke narrow self-interest to sustain the common weal, for they are the patriots the nation needs. Blessed are they who rise above partisan loyalties, for they shall administer a public trust. And blessed are all people who seek justice in an imperfect world, for they shall be welcomed into the beloved community. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, I'm going to invite up uh, Councillor Janey, who has a special presentation, and joining her are uh, Councillors, well, myself, Councillor Presley, Councillor Edwards. Um, who else is joining? Okay, thank you. Um, and Madam Clerk, if you could amend the attendance record to reflect that Councillor Wu is present. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, we have some really important guests joining us this afternoon. Right up here yep. with us. Uh, so um, again, thank you. Um, this is a, a special recognition for some special women in our community. Folks may recall back in February, I think it was on February 28th, I stood here with my colleagues and we uh, acknowledged and celebrated black immigrants. And today we want to particularly lift up black women, black Afro-Latina women uh, who are doing so much in our community. And I think it's really important to lift up these women, not just for their contributions, but because they of oftentimes face unique challenges. And when I think about our sisters, you know, throughout the diaspora that are still without their children, and all of the things that um, it, all of the things that are that are happening in our country right now. Uh, many folks don't know. I think I shared then uh, that I am the great granddaughter of of uh, immigrants from Guyana, and so I I feel the special connection, um, and just want to celebrate you. So on July 25th. Uh, we recognized Afro-Latina Day and Afro-Caribbean Day, particularly for women, um, and just wanted to recognize and have you come forward to present this resolution uh, to you on behalf of me, 
uh, my colleagues here and all of the co my colleagues on the council to say thank you for the work that you do. Um, so with that being said, I want to invite uh, Yvette uh, Modestine to the podium. Uh, thank you. Morning, everyone. Afternoon. Um, thank you, Councillor Janey. But we share this moment with all the female councillors, the queens, the fierce uh, women of Boston, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Edwards, and Councillor uh, Presley. Uh, today is not, it's, it's about looking beyond borders. It's about looking beyond language. It's about looking beyond culture. It's about acknowledging our common history, our common pain, our common struggle, wherever we are standing. So I ask all the black women in this space to please stand up and rise up with us, even if you're not standing here. So rise up, take your place, own our space, because we deserve it, we work for it, and we are here to say, I see you, because we see each other. I'm gonna hand it over to Vanessa Silva, who's one of our young leaders uh, from Encuentro Diaspora for the April 4th movement and the Boston Coalition for Freedom. And then Ann Monderser will say a few words. But most importantly, today is a very special day for us in Boston, because I'm also welcoming Boston's new meteorologist, Denise Isaac, uh, who is Panamanian born and very proud to say, my cousin. Uh, so, so Boston, you have another Modestin in town. <laughs> so you'll hear more about her outside, but she's now on NBC10, NECN, and Telemundo. So we have a talented Afro-Latina, Panamanian-born uh, uh, queen in Boston now reporting for us. So I'm going to hand it over to Vanessa real quick and Anne. Thank you so much for having me, um, for welcoming us to this space. I guess um, I just want to be here and serve as a reminder um, that how important it is, it is for us as a network of women of the Afro diaspora to organize together um, and how we are connected on so many fronts and why we focus on women of the diaspora because we are some of the most marginalized people um, in the world. And when you pick up the most most mar marginalized people, excuse me, and the most vulnerable, you lift everyone up. Yes. So we just want to remember that. Um, and in the spirit of Ubuntu, I am because we are. Amen. Thank That's you again it. for having me um, and all of us in this space as we celebrate each other. Thank you. Uh, gracias por tenernos aquí hoy. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Anne Mondesir. Es un honor estar aquí con Yvette. Una mujer que inspira valor y que me inspira a que continúe luchando por todos nosotros afrolatinas. Que mantengamos nuestras frentes alta en honrar a nuestras raíces áfricas. Me llena de orgullo estar en una ciudad que poco a poco, paso a paso, está reconociendo quiénes somos. Pero más importante es que nosotras, nosotras reconozcamos quiénes somos que nuestras raíces son de la realeza y que alrededor del mundo, no importa de qué país con raíces africanas somos, tenemos más en común y más que nos unes de los que nos separa. Gracias. Thank you so much. And we'll be outside for the next hour just celebrating and we ask anyone to join us and say a few words from where you stand as a black woman today uh, and every day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if folks would come up for a quick picture, that'd be great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay. I want to hear in the I'm not sure if you wish I know. So, I'm not sure if you wish I'm not sure if Got it.
Um, at this time, Councillor Flynn uh, will bring up um, a special group of folks for a special presentation. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam President. On June 26, a two-alarm fire broke out at 31 Mercer Street in South Boston. Thanks to the quick response of approximately 60 members of the Boston Fire Department on scene, the blaze was able to be controlled on the third floor. These firefighters encountered intense heat and a large volume of fire. They ran inside and rescued a woman trapped on the porch of the third floor. Fire alarm operator Lisa Gregorio, a neighbor of ours in South Boston, a neighbor of Council of Flaherty's as well, <clears throat> stayed on the phone with her and kept her calm the entire time. Five people were injured, including three firefighters. These firefighters risked their lives to save others and contain the blaze. In an act of selflessness, the firefighter that saved the woman trapped on the third floor removed his ear mask and gave it to her to wear. He carried her down two flights of stairs out of the burning building. Boston's emergency medical services were able to quickly treat residents suffering from smoke inhalation. They rushed both the residents and firefighters to the hospital. The Boston police were on the scene in record time they secured the streets, controlled the gathering crowds, provided assistance for both Boston Fire and EMS. With little fan fanfare, our first responders worked hard every day to keep our residents of Boston safe. They placed themselves in danger to protect our city and save lives. And what could have been a tragic night for our city, they showcased the bravery, skill, professionalism that were our first responders provide to all the residents of Boston. We are thankful to them for always looking out for us and protecting us in time of need. I wanted to honor our police, our firefighters, our EMS that were on scene. Um, they do their job, they do it well, they're professionals, they often get um, little public recognition. I just thought it might be um, a good way to say thank you for their efforts on what they do. Not just in this neighborhood, but throughout the neighborhoods of Boston. I talk to all my city councilors and they feel the same way about the first responders in the na their neighborhood as well. So I just wanted to say thank you to them. I'm proud to welcome um, District Chief Mark Buchanan, Captain Hernandez, Engine Company 39, Ladder Company 18, Lieutenant McManus, Engine 2, Ladder 19, Firefighter Scott Rothwell, Engine 21. I mentioned our neighbor in South Boston, Lisa Gregorio. But we're also proud of Chief Hooley, Boston Emergency Medical Services as well, Superintendent O'Hare, Superintendent Morley, Superintendent Hassan, Captain McGovern, EMT McLaughlin, Shepard McCabe. Finally, I also want to thank our Boston Police that 
were on scene as well. But we want to welcome Saja McNeil from the Boston Police. Again, on behalf of my um, colleagues on the Boston City Council, Council, and on behalf of Mayor Walsh as well, we want to say thank you to your professionalism and hard work and dedication to the people of Boston. We do have several proclamations that I will, um, I will hand out, but um, at this time, I'd like to ask a representative from the fire, from police, and from EMS if they'd like to come forward and um, say a quick word. Uh, I just want to thank the Boston Fire Department for having such a good training staff. Uh, if it wasn't for our training department and the hard work of the firefighters, uh, they did a great job um, rescuing the woman on the third floor, and at the same time, they did a fantastic job protecting property on both sides of the fire building. Thank you. Um, on behalf of Boston EMS, I, um, I have to give credit to the uh, EMTs and paramedics that are out in the ambulances every day. Um, it's one thing to show up and be the incident commander and orchestrate uh, things, but uh, those men and women, uh, they do the hard work every day. They did all the hard work that night, and uh, we're very fortunate that uh, we had a good outcome. And thank you for having us here today. wasn't on scene that day, but uh, just representing the, uh, the guys and girls from District 6 that were, and happy to assist Boston Fire and Boston EMS. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I do have official proclamations that I will provide, but in the interest of time, I'll hold off for, um, for a later time. But um, again, I just want to say, say thank you to the Boston Police, Boston Fire, and EMS as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, could my, could my city council colleagues please come up for a photo? Um, at this time, we're going to move on to uh, the regular order of business. Um, and before we actually do that, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, 
We scheduled Commissioner Evans, obviously from the police department, and or soon to be Commissioner Gross to be here today. Um, Commissioner Evans at the last minute got pulled into something, so he sends his apologies. Um, so we put together a citation, a gift, uh, just a package to thank him for his 30 plus years of service on behalf of the council. So I just want to let my colleagues know um, that we will get that to Commissioner Evans on behalf of the entire council and this staff. Um, and at some later point in time, we will um, welcome the soon to be Commissioner Gross um, to the council and to wish him luck in his uh, new position. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, moving on to approval of the minutes. If there are no corrections to be made, the minutes of the last council meeting will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objection, the minutes of the last council meeting are so approved. Uh, moving on to communications from His Honor the Mayor. Docket number 1148, message disapproving an ordinance amending chapter two of the City of Boston Code, ordinances regarding lobbyist registration and regulation. Docket number 0987, passed by the City Council July 27, 2018. Along with this veto, I am filing a redrafted ordinance that I urge you to approve expeditiously. Filed in the office of the City Clerk on July 13, 2018. Uh, docket 1148 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could read docket... 1149 and 1150 together, that'd be great. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Docket 1149, message and order approving home rule petition to the general court entitled, An Act to Regulate Lobbying Activities Before the City of Boston. This home rule petition modifies docket number 0101, passed by your honorable body on June 27, 2018, which remains unsigned and will not be submitted to the general court for consideration. Docket number 1150, message and ordinance amending CBC ordinances chapter 18, 18-1.16, parkway or street occupancy permit for delivery vehicles, filed in the city clerk's office on July 30th, 2018. Uh, dockets 1149 and 1150 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Docket number 115. Actually, we, Madam Clerk, if we could read docket 1151 and 1152 together. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Docket 1151, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $3,253,317 in the form of a grant for the FY19 PSAP grant awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund the costs associated with providing enhanced 911 public safety answering point services. Docket number 1152, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $472,063 in the form of a grant for the FY18 State 911 Training Grant awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund the training and certification of enhanced 911 telecommunication staff. Dockets 1151 and 1152 be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Docket number 1153, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $95,000 in the form of a grant for the HBS Service Leadership Fellow awarded by Harvard Business School to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will fund the Harvard Business School Fellow as a full-time employee in the Mayor's Office. Um, at this time, the Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket uh, 1153. And just uh, to provide some more additional information on what this docket is, um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's um, Harvard Business School Service Leadership Fellow. It's a year-long uh, fellowship. It's full-time in the Mayor's Office. It reports to the Mayor's Chief of Staff. Um, the resources were awarded by the Business School to provide this fellow um, an opportunity to work in the Mayor's Office, to work on several issues facing the City of Boston as determined by um, either that fellow or the Mayor's Office uh, in partnership. This time, I seek suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1153. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay.
The ayes have it. Docket 1153 has been passed. Docket number 1154, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $80,000 in the form of a grant for early childhood innovation awarded by the Pitton Foundation to be administered by the Mayor's Office. The grant will fund the Early Educator Space Project, which will retain and expand the supply of child care homes. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. I apologize, I lost my, well I was moving for a suspension, I'm sorry, can we have a brief recess? Oh sure. Yes. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk, if you could read dockets 1155 and 1156 together. Docket number 1155, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $32,932.74 in the in a form of a grant for the FFY 2018 STEP grant awarded by the United States Department of Transportation passed to the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund the Traffic Enforcement Program High Visibility Year-Round Enforcement using data to focus sharply on specific dates and locations where crashes occur excuse me, most frequently. Docket number 1156, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $3,500 in the form of a grant for the Connecting the Pieces Award by the United States Department of Justice, passed through the Boston Public Health Commission to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund participants to learn and develop peaceful resolution to prevent and de-escalate youth violence. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council McCarthy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, I rise to uh, request uh, suspension and passage of both 1155 and 1156. Uh, 1155 is uh, utilizing uh, data to help uh, our CSOs respond better to uh, traffic incidents and prevent traffic incidents, more importantly. And 1156 uh, is straightforward, uh, the CSOs uh, utilizing the grant money to prevent and, and de-escalate youth violence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council McCarthy. Council McCarthy, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, seeks suspension of the rules and passage of dockets 1155 and 1156. I will take them separately. All those in favor of passage of docket 1155, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1155 has been passed. All those in favor of passage of docket 1156, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1156 has been passed. <clears throat> docket, docket number 1157, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Rebecca Gutman as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 15, 2020. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I rise to ask that we suspend the rules and confirm Rebecca Goodman as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health. She has extensive experience in building coalitions and advocating on behalf of both our health care workers and their patients. She has specific experience with our personal care attendants, our PCAs, who are so important for our neighbors with permanent or chronic disabilities as they remain and thrive in community and work to maintain their independence. Her lens is critically important for the Board of Health as we continue to fight disparities and preventable diseases and look to foster health in every single neighborhood. As the Chair of the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, I move to confirm Ms. Goodman so the Board can continue its critical work. Thank you, Councilor Presley. 
At this time, Councilor Presley, who is the chairwoman of the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, uh, seeks suspension of the rules and confirmation of docket 1157. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1157 has been confirmed and passed. Moving on to petitions, memorials, and remonstrances. Docket number 1158, petition of local motion of Boston for a license to operate motor vehicles for the carriage of passengers for hire over certain streets in Boston. And docket number 1159, petition of above all transportation for a license to operate motor vehicles for the carriage of passengers for hire over certain streets in Boston. Council, will you have the floor? Um, if you could just assign these to committee, please. I apologize. I thought these were already in your committee. Um, no, they're not. Nope, these are new ones. Thank you, Councilor Wu. At this time, Madam Clerk, if we could assign dockets 1158 and 1159 to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, moving on to reports of public officers and others. And if we could read dockets 1160 through 1167. Together, that would be great. Why am I missing that page? Just one moment. Take your time. Yeah, for some reason. In our shuffling of papers, I lost the page. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thanks. <laughs> Docket number 1160, notice to receive from the mayor of the appointment of Zari Amr Hosseinian as a commissioner of the Persons with Disability Advisory Board for term expiring May 1st, 2019. 1161, notice to receive from the mayor of his absence from the city from 8.40 a.m. on Thursday, July 19th, 2018 until 8.30 p.m. on Friday, July 20th, 2018. Docket number 1162, notice was received from the mayor of his absence from the city from 4 o'clock p.m. on Saturday, July 28th, 2018, until 12 p.m. on S Sunday, August 5th, 2018. Docket number 1163, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of June 20th, 2018. Docket number 1164, notices received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of June 27, 2018. Docket number 1165, notices received from the city clerk <clears throat> in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor and papers acted upon by the city council at its July 11th, 2018 meeting. Docket number 1166, communication was received from Brian P. Golden, director of the Boston Planning and Development Agency regarding the report and decision on the application of the Trinity Orient Heights Phase Two, Chapter 121A project. And docket number 1167, communication was received from Brian P. Golden, director of Boston Planning and Development Agency regarding the proposed eminent domain taking of city of Boston owned property in Boylston Street, St. Cecilia Street, Scotia Street, and Cambria Street. Dockets 1160 through 1167 will be placed on file. Docket number 1168, the Constable Vaughn of Giovann Colon and Wallace Tilford having been duly approved by the collector treasurer were received. The chair seeks approval of docket 1168 under the usual terms and conditions. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1168 has been approved under the usual terms and conditions. Uh, moving on to matters recently heard for possible action. Madam Clerk, if we could read docket 0506 and 0807 together, that'd be great. Thank you, Madam President. Docket number 0506, message in order to declare surplus city-owned former public works department parcel known as Leo M. Birmingham Parkway in the Alston-Brighton 
to transfer care, custody, management, and control of said property to the Public Facilities Commission. Docket number 0807, message in order to declare surplus city-owned former Public Facilities Department parcels with vacant buildings and transfer the care, custody, management, and control of said property to the Public Facilities Commission. The land is located at 48 Tilston Street in the North End, District 3, Ward Parcel, Ward 3, I'm sorry, Parcel 02295000 and 50 Tilston Street in the North End District, Ward 3, Parcel 02294000. Council, you have the floor. Now Thanks. I see what I did. <laughs> I love it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. So I'll speak on all of them together and then invite the district councilors to chime in as well. We had a hearing on this batch of requests. Um, there are two different types of requests divided among three council districts. Um, the first type is a surplus, which is to... Uh, council, with just a quick point of clarification. Okay. Are you going to speak on more than docket 0506 and 0807? Oh, sorry. I, yes, I'm going to speak on. Okay. If okay, I'm going to speak. On, I would prefer yep. to speak on all of them together. So 0808, 0980, 102, and 1024. Yep. Perfect. I, I, Madam I'll Clerk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll take the them record. up separately. Thank, thank you. you. Docket number 0808. Message in order for your approval to authorize the sale of certain <coughs> portion. Excuse me of public way known as 90 Cottage Street, East Boston, is shown in the plan of land entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Discontinuance Plan, Vertical 90 Cottage Street, East Boston, dated November 21st, 2017, specifically containing about 16.9 square feet and 533 cubic feet, the discontinuance parcel. Docket number 0980, message in order to declare surplus city-owned former Boston Redevelopment Authority parcels of vacant land and courthouse and the transfer, the care, custody, management, and control of said property to the Public Facilities Commission. The land located at a portion of 135 Dudley Street, Roxbury, Mass, being Ward 12, parcel 0011800, Zero, 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 consisting of approximately 156,788 square feet of vacant land and courthouse, but specifically excluding the portion of the assessor's parcel retained for library use, a portion of 2,406 square feet, Washington, I'm sorry, a portion of 2,000 406 Washington Street, Roxbury, being Ward 12, parcel 02-0123-000, consisting of approximately 4,480 square feet of land adjacent to the 135 Dudley Street, but specifically excluding the portion of the assessor's parcel retained for police use. Docket number 1024, message and order authorizing the sale of certain portion of public way known as Everett Street, Alston, as shown on a plan and entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Discontinuance Plan, Everett Street, Alston, dated March 22nd, 2018, specifically containing about 4,417 square feet, the discontinued parcel. Docket number 1076, message and order approving the appropriation. No, that's it. Oops, We're going to stop at 1024. Got carried away again. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council Boo, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, again, so I will invite the district colleagues to chime in. I'll go in order of the, um, the docket numbers as they appear on the agenda. Uh, so first, 0506 is in Councilor Siomo's district. This is to be a little irregularly shaped parcel to be used as open space that the abutter has agreed to take on. Um, docket 0807 in Councillor Edwards District is uh, two small parcels of interest to um, specifically to NEMPAC, the North End um, Music and Performing Arts Center. It would be put out to bid and um, very, the intention right now is to make sure that it goes to community use. This was part of the land swap that the city did with 
have the North Bennett Street School and the Elliott School and all of that in the North End. So we were, um, we had a commitment publicly that this, the strong, strong intention is that this will be community space. And impact so far, as, as far as I know, is the only one who is, only organization that has expressed interest. There's always a provision when the RFP goes out that should they receive a very lucrative private offer, the city can um, consider that, but that would trigger, if for some reason that happened, that would trigger another conversation and community public process before the city changed course and went from um, community space to private development. Um, docket 0808 um, is in East Boston and is just a vertical discontinuance of air rights for balconies that overhang the sidewalk for about two feet. Um, docket 0980 is to round out certain parcels for a commercial parcel within the Plan Dudley um, area that Councilor Janey will speak on. And docket 1024 is discontinuing a little stub of a street that kind of leads up to the, tr uh, the tracks uh, in Councilor Siomo's district in Alston. Um, the utilities will be preserved as is. There will be the same access and rights. Uh, but it will just be no longer be marked as a, a public way. Okay, I think I covered mm -hmm. everything. So again, feel free to chime in. We had a hearing and had many questions answered on all of this. We will need to take two different types of votes. So the two parcels that are um, sale, uh, discontinuance and sale, docket 0808 and 1024 will require two readings. So I uh, would recommend the first reading today and the others would be a two thirds roll call vote for passage. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Any other district councilors wishing to uh, speak on any of these dockets? No, you did an excellent job, apparently. Um, so we're going to take them one by one. And um, just for point of clarification, uh, Madam Clerk, for dockets 05060807, the surplus land uh, properties. Yes. I'm under the impression they don't require a roll call vote. You don't we have don't, to do a roll call just vote. Just a super majority, though. If you were That's there, right. Um, though anyone opposed, they w you would have to do a roll call. Perfect. Um, so at this time, we're going to start with dockets 0506. Um, Council Rue, who's the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, recommends um, acceptance of her committee report and passage of docket 0506. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0506 has been passed. Um, docket 0807, the same, Council Rue, Chair of the Committee on uh, Planning, Development, and Transportation, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0807. All those in favor say aye. aye. <laughs> Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0807 has been passed. For docket 0808, which involves a sale of land, this is a vote, this is a matter that requires two readings, two votes, and a roll call vote. So for docket 0808, we will do the first reading and first vote today. Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 0808 has received its first reading with a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0808 will be assigned for further action. Um, docket 0980, surplus, so we will go back to a regular vote. Um, all, Council Rue, who is the chairman, chairwoman of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0980. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0980 has been passed. Uh, docket 1024, which involves sale of a certain portion of land, um, requires two votes, two readings. So we will do the first reading today and the first vote today. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll for docket 1024. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. 
Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 1024 has received its first reading with a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1024 will be assigned for further action. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could read docket 1076 and 1077 together. Docket number 1076, message and order approving the appropriation of $5,429,304 for the purpose of paying for the costs associated with window replacement project at the John Marshall Elementary School, known as UP Academy. This includes the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, and for which the City of Boston may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, known as the MSBA. Set amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. Docket number 1077, message and order approving appropriations of $600,000 for the purpose of paying for the costs of a feasibility study and schematic design work associated with projects at the following schools. The Rafael Hernandez School, boiler replacement, Patrick Linden School, boiler replacement, Donald McKay K through eight school, boiler replacement, James Otis School, window replacements, Josiah Quincy Elementary School, boiler replacement, Snowden International School at Copley, roof replacement, and the John D. O'Brien School of Mathematics and Science, window replacement. This includes the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto and for which the City of Boston may be eligible for a grant for the Massachusetts School Building Authority known as MSBA. Said amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. Councilor Sioma, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, the committee held its hearing on Monday, and we had testimony from Brian McLaughlin, Chief of Staff uh, from Public Facilities Department, as well as Tom Welsh, the Associate Superintendent of BPS. Um, these appropriations include payments towards construction costs for the window replacement project at the Marshall Elementary School, UP Academy, and a feasibility study for projects at seven other Boston public schools. Uh, these appropriations are eligible for grants from M MSBA, approximately 60 plus percent reimbursement. Uh, these repairs will not materialize uh, um, until next summer, but they will extend the useful life of all, all those schools for aforementioned and preserve uh, the BPS assets. So I uh, recommend passage of uh, uh, this docket. Of dockets, to, first two first, readings. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siomo. Uh, Councilor Siomo, who is the chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, um, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of these dockets. Both of these dockets require two votes, two readings. Um, so we will take each one separately and then they will be assigned for further action. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could do a roll call vote starting with docket 1076. Docket 1076, Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 1076 has received its first reading with a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1076 will be assigned for further action. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could call the roll for docket 1077. 
Docket number 1077. Councilor Baker? Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell? Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo? Yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Edwards? Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George? Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey? Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor McCarthy? Yes. Councilor McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley? Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley? Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, yes. And Councilor Zakem. Yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Um, Madam President, docket number 1077 has received its first reading with a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1077 will be assigned for further action. I'm moving on to docket 1084. Docket number 1084, message and order authorizing the City of Austin to accept and expend an amount of $90,000 in the form of a grant for the Community Gardens Grant awarded by TD Bank to be administered by the Mayor's Office. Mm -hmm. The grant will fund the act activation of community gardens and green spaces located in the City of Boston. Councilor Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, yesterday we held a very informative and worthwhile hearing uh, as it relates to docket number 1084. This is a $90,000 grant awarded by TD Bank for community gardens and green spaces across the city. Uh, participants included Chris Carter and Michael Evans for the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. Now you may ask why they were there to oversee a grant as it relates to community gardens, why it wasn't under uh, our wonderful Chief of Energy and Open Space slash Parks Commissioner Chris Cook. And that's because this isn't about having more uh, resources, more seeds, more plantings, more shrubs, more uh, crops to grow in the community gardens, but it's really to do something innovative. And I want to talk to you briefly about it. This is a $90,000 grant which will uh, be able to uh, 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 have a reach into six different neighborhoods in Boston, including Roxbury, Eastie, South End, Jamaica Plain, Dorchester, Mission Hill, and Mattapan. Uh, and it will be used for some public art in these community gardens. It will be used for uh, uh, community and skill building engagement. It will be used for basic infrastructure. They're actually going to build a mobile uh, solar powered little conference area. So I assume it's not much larger than a um, than an elevator, but it will allow for um, some meeting space to help grow people and to grow our community gardens. I think this is a fabulous idea. Uh, we have 200 community gardens throughout the city of Boston. It's about 50 acres of our land, our community gardens. I support everything we can to increase that number, and I really think this is an innovative way of taking some money and not just throwing it as we often have at sort of your typical thoughts as it relates to community gardens, but really helping to grow that, get more people involved. It's a great thing and urge all of us to act quickly and uh, support this uh, today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley. At this time, Councilor O'Malley seeks uh, acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1084. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1084 has been passed. Moving on to motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 1169, Councilor O'Malley offered the following order for a hearing regarding dockless mobility and electric scooters in the city of Boston. Council Mellie, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I, I wish I could say that my timing was uh, was by design, but it's really been more fortuitous that there have been about 25 different <laughs> articles about dockless uh, scooters uh, in the newspaper lately. Uh, but it's an innovative idea that I want this body to really lead on and call a hearing on. I rise today to explore the possibility of dockless mobility in the city of Boston. Creating and sustaining reliable, equitable transportation continues to be a challenge we face as a city. Difficulty getting from here to there is one of the biggest issues that we hear in our neighborhoods. New innovation gives Boston both a challenge and an opportunity to expand mobility options for our residents. Now, for the last several years, we've had a successful bike share program. Initially, it was Hubway. Now, it's called Blue Bikes, and this is something that I support. You are all invited to the first Hubway or Blue Bike Station in West Roxbury, which should be unveiled at the end of this month. Um, but many other municipalities, including 15 communities surrounding Boston, have dockless bikes and are exploring electric scooters. We see that with increasingly frequency. You walk down Cambridge Street, you're going to see a couple of bikes of different colors than blue uh, that don't come with a docking station or, or can't uh, be connected to a docking station on the streets. You'll also see some scooters with increasing frequency. Now, 
what some other cities, such as Brookline and I believe Cam or Somerville and Cambridge have done recently has just been to outlaw it completely, which I understand that there, there are some, some concerns, some outstanding questions, but I hope we can take a more proactive approach as it relates to Boston. Um, electric scooters are already appearing on our streets, as I said, because residents use them to travel into the city. If we can coordinate the introduction of electric scooters in Boston and surrounding communities, we can ensure this new option become an integrated uh, transportation system across the region. These scooters provide a good experience to our residents and our city since they provide convenient and nearly door-to-door -door transportation. They help folks get to a far-off T station. This is particularly noteworthy in the neighborhoods of West Roxbury, Hyde Park, and Mattapan, where there is no close rapid transit system, but many folks could use it to get there. Um, it helps folks that work during the middle of the night. We've seen that in Malden, a great success at that. Um, and it shows that a lot of use by shift workers who commute at times when the MBTA does not run. Um, cities such as Seattle and Washington, D.C., the presence of dockless transit has also caused a reduction in both traffic congestion and carbon emissions. And as we continue to face the effects of climate change, it's vital that we cre create sustainable transit solutions that will benefit our environment. From a financial perspective, dockless mobility does not require the construction of expensive docks and could bring new funding to the city through revenue sharing with electric scooter providers. At the same time, I know there are many concerns and I hope to hear some of them today, um, but that's why we're having a hearing as a first step to address them. I hope we can craft sensible regulation for Boston through discussing possible trade-offs. For instance, allowing dockless mobility overnight helps with the transit equity for shift workers, but might create other safety concerns. If we succeed at finding common ground on this issue, electric scooters will provide a convenient way for people to get around and particularly help areas of the city that are underserved by public transit. I understand that the BTD is exploring a pilot of dockless electric scooters in the city. This is a great thing, but this should be a conversation that we have together. Nobody knows the neighborhoods of the city of Boston as well as the 13 of us. So as we explore this new regulation, we cannot wait too long. Our residents are voting with their feet to get around in ways not approved by the city. I hope we can get in front of this issue and prepare for the benefits and changes that dockless mobility will bring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President, and um, thank you, thank you Councillor O'Malley, for, for introducing this here. 30 years ago, a friend of mine said to me when we were traveling to California, what you see in California today, you're going to see in, in Boston or the East Coast six months, eight months later. I was in California, Santa Monica in March. Mm -hmm. The birds were all mm -hmm. over the place. That's what the name of the, of the scooters are. Um, plastic, plastic straws are also there, so we'll be hearing about those next. But <laughs> um, So some of, some of the, the, the challenges they had there was just more on the operators and, the, and, and where they were putting, putting their dockless scooters. I think it is a good, a good opportunity to, to maybe get some people out of the Ubers, and with, especially with the shorter, shorter trips. I personally will not be on one of them. Okay, um, but I think, I think it could potentially be a good transportation means for us, um, especially if we start talking about real pathways that you can walk, bike, and possibly on the, on the scooters towards the city, south of the city, north of the city, bring it into city center. I think I just want to um, thank Councilor O'Malley for this, and I'd like to sign on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor uh, Baker's name. Councilor Siomo, you have the floor. Thank you. I rise to commend the maker and ask that my name be added as well. I was in Santa Monica last <laughs> week, and to the point that uh, my good friend from Jamaica Plain alluded to, uh, they were scattered everywhere. There was dozens within a quarter of a mile. And it, it just didn't seem to be any kind of regulation at all. Uh, that would trouble me if, if I saw that here. So I, I commend you for getting ahead of this before it becomes uh, that kind of problem. There were, they were everywhere in short uh, spans of, of, uh, of the streetscape and, uh, you know, could create problems for uh, people, pedestrians especially, as well. So commend the author, ask that my name be added. Uh, thank you, Councillor Siomo. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Siomo's name, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Janey, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor Presley, Councillor Zakum. Councillor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I also rise to commend the maker and um, ask that my name be added. Uh, just a few observations on this. Um, I think one, there's a big difference between the bikes and the scooters, both in terms of who's using them, but also how neatly they kind of fit places. The bikes are a lot bigger and the scooters, like, you know, think of the kids' scooters that, that Blaze has, but 
a little bigger, um, you can kind of tuck it right against the curb. So um, I like that the, the, I love that the hearing order includes both and that we could be thinking about both and treating them differently. Um, the parallel in my mind, especially thinking about California coming before us, is about food trucks. Same phenomenon where we kind of saw it over there and then realized that our streets are so narrow that letting them kind of roam everywhere and stop wherever wasn't going to work for Boston, how it was working or not working out there. Um, so similarly, just having that as an idea of we could, just as we specify where food trucks can park and they've been thriving, similar, I mean, my concern with Dockless right now is that you'll get you know, all of Faneuil Hall overrun with bikes everywhere. So I think we can do it in a way where it's not quite docked, but still specified. Um, and if it builds more momentum for safe infrastructure, the, pith, the paths, the separated um, ways, that, that would be great. Finally, I just wanted to give a quick update because Councillor O'Malley brought up the outer lying neighborhoods, you know, Hyde Park, West Roxbury, Rosendale, that don't have great transit. Um, you know, we've been fighting for a fair equity, and the latest was that there would be a study that the T had agreed to that Senators Boncori and Rush had written into the budget. The House passed it, the Senate passed it, and then Governor Baker vetoed it. Um, so we know as of yesterday that uh, he has proposed a new version. The initial timeline to finish that fair equity study was January 2019. The governor's version now has it finishing March 2020. Um, so back to the original timeline, but building again more impetus for other ways that these neighborhoods can be connected. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wu. Uh, Madam Kirk, if you could add my name as well, the chair's name, um, and did I say add Council Wu as well? Yes. Perfect. Um, docket 1169 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Docket 1170, Councilor Flaherty's, uh, Councilors Flaherty and Flynn offer the following order for hearing regarding the South Boston Interim Planning Overlay District and Neighborhood Wide Zoning. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. As we all know, Boston is, uh, is undergoing a rapid uh, period of development and revitalization. And um, South Boston is probably one of the neighbors, neighborhoods that's been most impacted by that increased development and revitalization. And, whether you look around the South Boston waterfront, uh, you look at the uh, Washington Village site, you look at the development un underway down at the Ray Flynn Marine Industrial Park, you look at the proposal for the uh, former Edison site, you look at the growth zone, which is the section of Dorchester uh, Avenue from uh, Andrew Square to Broadway, uh, whether um, you look at, quite frankly, every square inch that uh, investors and developers are uh, jockeying and salvating and outbidding each other for. So, I think time has come to, to revisit uh, the new zoning schemes. The neighborhood went through uh, rezoning a couple of years ago with Article 68, um, and as a result, there were um, there were some deficiencies in in some of those schemes, uh, particularly as it pertained to there was no minimum lot size requirement placed uh, uh, as a as a sort of a space saver. So, as a result of which, we had to react and implement the South Boston Interim Planning Overlay District, also known as an iPod overlay. Uh, and with this in mind, uh, Council Flynn and I are presenting uh, this order for a hearing regarding uh, the overall zoning of South Boston, the rezoning of uh, East and West Broadway, as well as the, um, the deficiencies that exist because there's no minimum lot size. And a big part of it's born out of uh, meeting fatigue. Folks are meeting out in the neighborhood. They're just going to so many meetings because there's so much development happening and trying to raise their families, trying to work their one job, their two jobs take care of their, uh, their elderly or sick relatives, and, um, and as a result of which they're grabbing us on the local street saying, what's going on with this, what's going on with this, how does this work, how does that work? And it was really uh, sort of inspired from the, the meeting that occurred last week over in East Boston that uh, Councilor uh, Lydia Redwoods had proposed, and Councilor Wu was kind enough to chair and have it on site, and we're looking to do the same thing. We're looking to have uh, a city council hearing in the neighborhood uh, to take a look at the overall uh, zoning of South Boston the proposals that are uh, in the pipeline uh, and are currently uh, being discussed and how that does with uh, Article 68 as well as the interim iPod overlay as well as what every, everyone else wants to talk about. In uh, our neighborhood, just like many of your neighborhoods, they're cut through communities. Um, Boston can only be so big. I've, you, I know you've all heard me say this. Uh, we're not New York, we're not Chicago, we're not LA. We're only so big and, and, and a big chunk of us is surrounded by water. Uh, we're arguably a peninsula. So despite the fact that we want to continue to grow and we'll kind of continue to invite people to come here and to invest here and to get a great education and to get medical uh, 
uh, health care and, and financial service attention. The fact of the matter is that we're only so big, and we continue to just keep stuffing uh, new development projects into all of our neighborhoods. And, uh, and yet, uh, transportation in our transportation infrastructure, our roads and bridges aren't able to handle it, not able to keep up with it. Uh, and as a result of which, uh, you know, we have um, you know, gridlock in our streets. Uh, people can't get transportation to and from work. Everyone goes right to their app. Uber and Lyft just descends on your neighborhood, uh, adding to increased traffic congestion, and then uh, and speeding cars. And as a result, you know, we had a very tragic incident, uh, Council Flynn and I, in our district, in our neighborhood uh, last week on, on L Street, which is a main thoroughfare. It's a cut through uh, for our community. When a three year old boy uh, on the sidewalk, mind you, uh, with his four year old sister in, in the Niani, uh, and he was tragically killed uh, when two cars collided. And, one car ended up on the sidewalk. So that said, uh, time has come to, do, to bring the BRA out to the community to have a very frank discussion on what's working and what's not working with the current zoning, what's proposed, what does the community want, what's going to impact the quality of life of our neighbors and residents, and then how we're going to weave that with uh, the administration's housing goals, coupled with the fact that uh, we need to bring the transportation department in uh, and discuss uh, how we're going to uh, address the increased traffic flow um, with those new residents and those new businesses that will be coming to our city, coming to our neighborhood, and uh, folks will be traversing up and down our neighborhood streets. So, uh, and it's become the path of least resistance because anytime traffic builds up on one street, people just jump over to the other street. It's a grid, it's letters and numbers. If you know the alphabet and you can count to 10, you can get around Southie pretty quick. Um, so, uh, and, and we need to find a way to keep folks on, on 93. A big piece of this is, is traffic coming from both the South Shore and the North Shore. Uh, they're getting off uh, at the respective exits cutting through the community to get around the traffic that's on I-93. And so there's got to be a sort of a comprehensive neighborhood-wide solution with respect to uh, development, traffic, uh, and parking in the town. And I think the time has come. And we saw the meeting that was held last week uh, through Council Reverends. There had been several hundred people from the East Boston community because, quite frankly, they, they're looking across the, the harbor and they know that they're next. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for us to, uh, to work together, also an opportunity for East Boston to learn. Uh, from South Boston with respect to the rezoning we went through and pick up early as to where those deficiencies were and make sure that they're implemented uh, appropriately in their plan. At the same time, we need to make some adjustments and tweaks to, to our uh, new zoning plan as well. So without further ado, through the chair, uh, offer an opportunity for, for the co-sponsor to add uh, some of his thoughts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'm proud to join Councilor Flaherty um, on this effort. Um, I think Council Flaherty said it, said it best. This is about quality of life in our neighborhood. South Boston is a neighborhood of, of working families that have been here, that work hard, but the overdevelopment that has happened in this town for maybe 15 years um, is having a negative impact on the community. It's having a negative impact on the quality of life for our residents. and. When we do this planning, we also have to factor in uh, traffic, parking. What impact will development have on residents? What impact will it have on elderly getting from their development to, to the library? Are they able to safely navigate um, the streets and the, and the crosswalk? So it's about um, making sure that our long-term, long-time residents are also part of this process. And um, I'm confident that we can work hard and work closely with the city administration to make sure that South Boston um, is always a place where working class families can live and elderly and our disabled are, um, are welcome there as well. So I just want to thank Council Flaherty for taking the lead on this as well. Thank you, Madam President. Oh, thank you, Councilor Flynn. Anyone wishing to add their name uh, to this hearing order? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Baker, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Janey, Councilor Presley, Councilor Wu. Uh, docket 1170 will be assigned to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, moving on to Docket 1171. Docket number 117, excuse me, 1171. Councilor O'Malley offered the following order for hearing to discuss how the City of Boston can improve its wireless infrastructure. Council Malley of the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I wanted to begin by thanking uh, 
my incredible interns this summer who have worked so hard on the myriad issues I'm bringing before you today. So special shout out to Perrin Price, Kevin Kayami, Adam Krellen Sazama, Nathan Trantrin, and returning all-stars Matt Donovan and Peter Favorito. Um, we all have one of these. We all use one of these probably more frequently than any of us would care to admit. And you may have noticed a heightened number of dropped calls or emails that haven't gone through over the last year or two. Um, and that is precisely because the, num the population of the city is growing exponentially. It's grown by nearly 11% since I first took office in November of 2010. <laughs> Um, the number of devices, smart devices, has grown by a clip unlike anything we have uh, I, ever seen. There are more cellular phones in the United States than there are people who live in the United States of America. In Boston alone, it's, it's average that um, most people have about four devices. It could be a computer, it could be an iPad, it could be a wearable, it could be a health device, it could be an Alexa. These things go on and on, and they're using more and more data. It used to be a time where, and many of you remember, particularly I'm looking at Councillor Flaherty and if Councillor Siomo were here, uh, where there'd be hot debates over a cell phone tower being built somewhere. The good news is that instead of having one of those hulking large towers, they now have what's known as small cell nodes that basically look like a, a you know, a small box attached to a light pole that can help with transfer of, of information and of data. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is we have not done nearly enough to address that and build that infrastructure. Now, I would argue that as we talk about smartphones, as we talk about data sharing, this ought to be treated like a public utility. And this is one way, and this is through no fault of anyone other than there's a lot been going on in a city. Um, Boston has really been left behind. You go to other cities, particularly in Europe, and you may notice how much more effective their networks are. So that is why today I'm introducing this hearing order so we can have a direct hearing where we talk about um, this infrastructure, how we build it, and how we're able to sort of dig ourselves under this ditch that keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, right now, we use what's known as the 4G network to share data. Um, 5G will be available by 2020, which is less than two years from now. Uh, we don't even have enough capability to fully support the 4G network, so if we get to the 5G network, we're setting ourselves up for failure from the beginning. Uh, the numbers of, of growing devices, as I said, there are 262 million smartphone users in the U.S. There are over 180 million other connected devices that range from watches to smart home technology. And these numbers continue to place a strain on our current 4G mobile infrastructure. Now, this is not only a consumer issue in making sure that we can have support for all of our residents, it's a public safety issue as well. 80% of 911 calls now originate from mobile devices. Think about that for a minute. That is a remarkable statistic. There are upwards of close to 50% of medical health issues could be um, addressed, not in the emergency room necessarily, but with some smart device as it relates to some, some pub, one's public health. Um, the, the calls that we now get when there's a weather emergency, a severe storm, heck, we may get one later tonight. As climate change continues, we're going to be getting it with increased frequency. Uh, these are all ways that we can protect the public safety, uh, but it is so critical that we have a, a network in place that can handle it all. Um, New York City, Los Angeles, Dallas, Las Vegas have already begun their conversions and work of growing the network and getting to a 5G. Um, we are not there yet. So let's start by having a hearing. Let's talk about this. There are a whole host of different vendors that want to do it. That's the other thing. This is something that can be done at very little or no cost to the taxpayer. Um, and as is the case with us, whenever we have hearings like this, it's open to everyone and there will be a robust and transparent RFP process. But my God, we really need to get uh, up to it now because it is surprising. Since we've been doing some work, my team and I on this, um, it really is amazing how the network is so overly strained and we're not doing enough to address it. We can fix it. We can get it done right. So let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Add their names. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add uh, Councilor Baker, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Janey, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Presley, Councilor Wu, Councilor Jacob, as well as the Chair. Uh, docket 1171 will be assigned to the Committee on City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans and Military Affairs. Um, at this time, um, we are going to, uh, before we move on to personnel orders, pull something from the consent agenda. Um, Council Malley will explain. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, move to move docket 1203 from the consent agenda to motions, orders, and resolutions. Any objection? 
and just a point of clarification, it's a resolution um, that we were hoping to actually have in this section, but was added to the yeah. consent agenda instead. And we want to be able to talk about it publicly during the meeting, and particularly for a um, some folks who are in the chamber. Any objection? No, Councilor O'Malley, you may proceed. Oh, actually, may Madam Clerk, if you could read the docket into the record. Thank you. City of Boston and the City Council, resolution of Councilors Matt O'Malley and Ed Flynn. Whereas national grid workers are represented by the United States Steel Workers USW, local 12003 and 12012, and they work in communities throughout Massachusetts to safely provide gas services. <clears throat> Whereas the Boston City Council believes that gas service plays an important role in the functioning of Boston as an urban area, support the national grid workers as they fight for equity and decency. Therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council strongly advises national grid <clears throat> to end the lockout and negotiate the members of local 12003 and 12012 to ensure fair wages, affordable health care, and retirement benefits, as well as maintaining public safety, filed by Councillor Matt O'Malley and Councillor Edward Flynn. Um, does everyone have a copy of this? Wonderful. Councilor O'Malley, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I, I appreciate all of you letting me take this out of the mm -hmm. consent agenda. Um, I rise to speak on a resolution that I partnered with my dear colleague and friend, the District Councilor from South Boston, in support of the United Steel Workers Local 12003 and 12012-4. Um, I wanted to thank everyone here who's representing the incredible brave men and women of these two locals, particularly our presidents, Joe Carlo and John Bonapan, Bonapane. Uh, on June 25, 2018, more than 1,250 workers have been locked out by National Grid. Um, I visited some of the men and women down in West Roxbury. I was with many of you as there was a great, tremendous uh, uh, rally down at City Hall Plaza that went to the State House. Uh, Councillor Flynn and I originally did a letter, I think, shortly after the lockout began, and we had a thought of doing a resolution. My thought was, there's, as you know, a two-week break where we didn't meet. I said, Eddie. Who knows, I'm sure this will be resolved by then, and I was never more upset to be wrong. Um, it continues. It's been more than a month. These are men and women who are being deprived health care. These are men and women who are being treated so incredibly unfairly. Uh, these are men and women who are working for a company who has seen their profits grow exponentially, yet they are not supporting the men and women, the highly skilled men and women who are pre perform vital public safety issues. Um, I want to thank again the USW Local 12003 and 12012 for their courage, for their tireless effort to negotiate fair wages, affordable health care, and decent pensions. I give my complete support to these locked out workers who are fighting for equity, who are fighting for decency. Health care is a vital need for everyone, especially workers with families, and being denied competent coverage is a violation of human morality. National Grid has swiftly replaced these workers with out-of-state workers who were hastily trained. Their lack of experience on our system creates a potential risk to public safety. Last Friday, a private contractor had been working on a water main on Brookline Ave in Longwood. I believe it's Councillor Zakem's district. He had a six-inch gas line rupturing it and sending gas spewing into the air. Boston Fire Department had to evacuate three dormitories at Emanuel College, four residence halls at Simmons College, and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. They were, I'm sorry, at Bidmick, they were ordered to shelter in place while the operations continued. Had we had the trained men and women who've been doing this who know our line, I think it is safe to say that that would not have happened. This is a public safety issue. This is, a, uh, this is, this is beyond contemptible the way GRID has treated their men and women. And this isn't a strike, make no mistake, this is a lockout, and that is a vital difference. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of to have worked with many of you was our gas leaks bill that we passed several years ago. It was challenged by National Grid and we did not have a victory in court, um, but it just undermines what we are dealing with. Thousands of gas leaks that are out there. There was some good news yesterday at the state legislature in terms of reporting the unaccounted for gas. That will be helpful as we try to address this. But my God, we need to make sure that we have the trained men and women who know our system, who can be safe, who can make all of us and keep all of us safe, are back at their jobs. That is why Councillor Flynn and I are today asking for suspension and uh, adoption of this resolution. Uh, and we uh, urge uh, National Grid to end this lockout now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And um, 
just want to say thank you to my colleague, Councillor O'Malley, for your strong leadership on this issue. Um, I also want to thank Mayor Walsh and all of my colleagues that are here for always being there for working men and women of our city. I'm proud to stand with the United Steelworkers, 12003-12012. As Councillor O'Malley said, this is not a strike, this is a lockout. We were proud to march recently with working people in solidarity with the United Steelworkers. Many of them are here today. We want to say thank you for what you're doing for so many years, keeping us safe in this city and throughout our state. Our city and this, this body has always stood for working men and women for social and economic justice. Working men and women of this city deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. We had the opportunity about an hour ago to thank our city employees that also do a tremendous job. Richie Paris and 718, their job is public safety. Your job is public safety as well. With the recent Supreme Court decision, and, and Janus re asked me, it is clear that now more than ever, we must continue to support the lab labor movement and stand with working families. National Grid, as Councillor O'Malley mentioned, is making huge profits. 24% increase in profits this year alone. It is unconscionable for them to lock out these hardworking utility workers, suspend their health care, I'm proud of two of my relatives that are also part of the United Steel Workers that are present here today, um, Jack Hill Commons and, and Jamie Long as well. It is essential to public safety that we ensure a highly skilled, properly trained and professional workforce. Let them deal with these potentially dangerous situations. This is not a job you can contract out to the lowest bidder. It requires professionals like you, the United Steel Workers. In June, my colleagues and I sent a letter urging National Grid to approach these negotiations in good faith in the spirit of fairness. National Grid did not do that. They're not treating our workers with respect. These workers, they're our Little League coaches, they're our neighbors, they volunteer in our community. Again, I want to say thank you to my colleagues on this body and my colleagues in the State House as well, state legislators for their strong work in standing up for United Steel Workers as well. We will continue to support these workers here in Boston across our state to make sure that they're treated fairly, they're treated with respect and dignity because they earned it. And when we have potentially dangerous situations, it's, it's these men and women that come to our neighborhood and making sure our neighborhood is, 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 is safe. So we, we stand with you and we'll do everything as, as a body to make sure our workforce here throughout this state is uh, treated fairly and treated with respect. And um, I just want to uh, thank my colleagues for your many years of work and making sure that our workers are always treated with fairness uh, throughout the city. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, no, thank you, Councillor Flynn, and thank you, and uh, Councillor Malley, for bringing it forward. Um, at this time, anyone else looking to add their name? Uh, perfect. M uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Baker, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Janey, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Presley, Councilor Wu, Councilor Zakum, as well as the chair. Um, at this time, Councilors Flynn and O'Malley seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket, if you could remind me which one. 1203. 1203. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1203 has been adopted. Um, the resolution that's being passed out uh, is just the resolution that we sent to Commissioner Evans along with the gift um, that we awarded him for his years of service. So just so you guys have it. Um, moving on to Proceed. personnel orders. Docket number 1172, Councilor Campbell for Council McCarthy. Councilor McCarthy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1172. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1172 has been passed. Docket number 1173, Councillor Campbell for Councillor McCarthy. Councillor McCarthy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 1173. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. 
The ayes have it. Docket 1173 has been passed. Um, I am informed by the clerk that we have four late file matters, which in the absence of objection will be added to the agenda. Hearing and seeing no objection, the four late file matters are added to the agenda. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could read the first late file matter. Thank you, Madam President. Offered by Councilors Ayanna Presley and Tim McCarthy in the City of Austin, order for hearing to examine and discuss best equity practices in the city's marijuana licensing process and potential for social equity programs. Whereas in 2016, the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts approved a ballot question number four, a proposal to legalize and regulate adult use of marijuana with 53.7%. According to Massachusetts election statistics and the legislative <clears throat> legislature passed chapter 55 of the acts of 2017, an act to ensure safe access to marijuana. Therefore, be it ordered, that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council convene one or more public hearings to discuss the city's current marijuana licensing process and explore best equity practices as well. As policies and programs other municipalities are considering or have employed, those invited to provide testimony will include the City of Boston's Office of Economic Development, Zoning Board of Appeals, Resilience and Racial Equity Office and all other interested parties. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Just for a point of clarification, um, filed on, we just want to add a date to this. I don't have a copy on mine, but maybe there is on a more updated version. If not, we can add it and just um, it amend it um, and replace it for yeah, the technical. It's, it's the no problem. Um, at this time, Council Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I know it's, it's easy to sort of uh, shorthand the issue of uh, cannabis and this emerging multi-billion dollar industry uh, and just make it about either public safety or public health. Um, this was a dialogue that I initiated on this body because I see this as a criminal justice reform issue and also a small business issue. And if we are really serious about addressing um, economic injustices and income inequality and the wealth gap in our city, uh, it is really important that we make sure that those that were disproportionately incarcerated because of the war on drugs and locked up due to cannabis convictions are not now locked out of um, a multi-billion dollar industry. And so we learned with medicinal marijuana, and this is the challenge of introducing any industry by ballot measure of which this electorate passed by 53.7%. Um, with medicinal marijuana, we learned that there were 182 applicants, eight provisional licenses ultimately awarded, and not one went to a person of color. Uh, furthermore, many people in that application process um, verbally expressed a commitment to the hiring of veterans, to the hiring of women, to the hiring of people of color. There's really no clawback or accountability to see if in real time, once we went into implementation, any of that happened. And so uh, the purpose of initiating this hearing in partnership with a broad and diverse grassroots coalition that I was a part of, that's Equitable Opportunities Now, is to make sure that in real time we are implementing this legislation in such a way that we are prioritizing that it, these businesses are locally owned and that there is an equity in both workforce and also in ownership. And again, I see this as a criminal justice issue, but this is not only about those who have previously been incarcerated. It is simply about our being proactive about ensuring there is an equity in this industry. This body has worked with me 100 years later after the fact of liquor licensing to undo 100 years of hurt. <laughs> we have an opportunity to be the blueprint, to be the model for the nation in legislatively codifying equity in what stands to be a multi-billion dollar industry. So that's the purpose of this hearing, to look in real time to make sure that that is what we are doing as we move to implementation. Um, I thank um, the Chair of Public Safety for his partnership in this and uh, invite him for us to say a few words. Uh, like. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Councilor McCarthy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Councilor. I appreciate it, um, that. Um, a couple of years ago, we went to Denver, and uh, we were there for about four days, several counselors, uh, myself, uh, administration. And I will tell you, the one thing that we heard from the growers, 
from the store owners, from the people who uh, work in the hospitals, uh, from the police, anybody and everybody who had anything to do with this um, was talking about not letting the genie out of the bottle too fast. The more restrictions, the better. The more regulations, the better. And uh, as Council Presley said, uh, this is an issue that needs to stay uh, within Boston. We do have an opportunity here to do the right thing, not only uh, by the ownership of, of who owns these new shops that are open up, but by our community. And I think we've all seen uh, owners from outside the state come in, big box rolling in, and they're going to try to roll into our neighborhoods. Uh, and as, as I've stated before, I've had several looking in High Park, several in, in Mattapan, and several in Rosendale already. Um, the teams that are, are local uh, teams are, are welcome teams. And one of the, uh, one of the most memorable uh, visits that we had when I was in Denver uh, was in Simply Pure, which is a, a, a small store uh, owned by uh, a minority couple. Ironically, I had a Catholic memorial shirt on. I walked in, and he goes, CM, you're kidding me. He went to Archbishop Williams and grew up in Dorchester. <laughs> so, uh, but, but the statement that he was making was that he was the only minority-owned business out of all the licenses that Denver had given still around. Um, and that, that shouldn't happen. So I'm looking forward to uh, an expedited hearing and uh, looking forward to working with my colleagues. Thank you, uh, Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, first, let me say, please add my name. Uh, I want to commend uh, Councilors Presley and McCarthy for their leadership on this issue. This is a huge issue, certainly in my district, but throughout the city. Um, the issue of equity and who is going to be left behind. So many folks in my district have been marginalized and penalized um, around this issue of cannabis. And this is a real opportunity to help support women business owners, minority business owners. And I worry that we are going to miss out. Um, and not just because we're not um, necessarily going to implement it well, but because we, you know, still have a lot of the the not in my Madam backyard Clark. issue. And so I hope that we can have thoughtful conversations about what this is going to look like. It is legal um, and that we're able to support um, small business owners uh, in their efforts and do so in a way that makes sense for our neighborhoods. So thank you so much. I'm uh, just, I'm gonna take a quick recess. Thank you for the brief recess. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor Janey's name. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Councillor O'Malley of the floor. Just please add oh. my name, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, if you could add Councillor O'Malley, if you could add Councillor Baker, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, uh, Councillor Wu, Councillor Zakum, as well as the chair. The first late file matter will be assigned to the Committee on Small Business and Consumer Affairs. I'm uh, moving on to the second late file matter. Offered by City Councilors Ayanna Presley and Lydia Edwards. Resolution urging Congress to reauthorize the Violence Against Women, Women Act. Whereas the Violence Against Women Act, known as VAWA, was first enacted in 1994 and has since been reauthor reauthorized every five years. Whereas the new VAWA legislation was introduced to Congress as members were departing for recess, leaving a few short weeks upon return to discuss the reauthorization and passage of the legislation before the September 30th expiration. Therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council and meeting assembled go on record in support of the Violence Against Women Act 
with the newly added provisions expanding youth education and prevention programs, strengthening protections for victims, and developing a Violence Against Women director position within HUD, and urges Congress to pass the reauthorization VAWA filed on August 1st, 2018. Council Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, in a few moments, we'll take a vote on um, the revised sexual harassment policy that we've um, developed as a body and was initiated by, my, by uh, Councilor Zakem and myself. Uh, so we know that there is this renewed and elevated consciousness around uh, sexual harassment um, and sexual assault and sexual violence in the Me Too movement, enough is enough, and time's up. What has been missing from that national call to action and elevated consciousness is domestic violence. And I do believe that is because um, it is an issue where it is not only painful to consider that someone that you love could be um, oppressed and brutalized in such a way, but even harder to grapple with the fact that someone that you love could do that to someone. And so it's incumbent upon us to make sure that in this elevated moment of consciousness of these issues, that we are integrating domestic violence into this dialogue and into our policy making. This is not a crime that discriminates. Um, I grew up in a household where uh, someone who claimed to love my mother beat her mercilessly, um, beat her for being too pretty or not pretty enough, beat her for smiling too hard or not at all, beat her for being too smart or too dumb and uh, did everything to beat not only the life out of her, but the hope out of her. And it was a relationship that she stayed in out of economic dependence um, and for fear that we would have no place uh, to call home. And that is a story for millions of women. And in our Commonwealth alone, approximately half of women in Massachusetts um, have been connected to this issue in some way. Uh, in this resolution, which is uh, self-explanatory, there are two whereases I do just want to lift up. Um, that I think are especially important. So um, there is new violence against women legislation which incorporates provisions for the expansion of education and prevention programs, and this is the part I want to underscore, strengthening protections for women utilizing housing grants. This continues to be an issue where women like my mother cannot get emergency housing um, and remain in an abusive environment to have shelter and because of economic dependence. Um, strengthening protections for women utilizing housing grants and creating a violence against women director position in the department of HUD. Now, the reason why we're doing this resolution is because the new VAWA legislation was introduced to Congress as members were departing for recess, leaving a few short weeks upon their return to discuss the reauthorization and passage of this legislation before the September 30th expiration. And so in that this is our, our, our only opportunity uh, to, to lift up this issue and to stand in solidarity and to double down on the need for uh, these new protections. Uh, that is why Councilor Edwards and I are introducing it today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. I just want to commend the maker and thank you again for inviting me to have some comments about this. Uh, I fully support this also because of the experience I had in representing many immigrant women. As many people are, may not be aware, VAWA also provides for U visas. And what that means is it's encouraging us to tell the women to tell their stories, uh, many of whom will not come forward because they are undocumented or they're in an immigration process. And what this does is it protects the victims of crime, so it actually helps us in assuring that we are able to prosecute and have witnesses in trial who feel protected to have their voices heard. And VAWA provides this special mechanism that our police officers use, that our prosecutors use, to help provide this protection for a lot of the women to come forward. But I think also it's really important, and to echo many of the things that my um, my colleague has already stated, this is about economic justice as well. This is about a, a, a national conversation which I don't think had happened until 1994 when VAWA had passed, where the nation recognized that violence against women impacted us economically and impacted us in such a huge way and the multi, multiple layers of oppression, not only because many women felt that they couldn't leave, but many women weren't going to work. Many women were losing their jobs because of missed, um, missed days at work. Many women were losing their jobs or being disciplined because of the fact that they were late to work 
or doing all sorts of ways in which to cover up the abuse that they were suffering from. So there was an economic impact as well. And being able to provide these resources, this education, and these support systems was vital for us to, as a nation to take that step forward. So I, again, uh, echo uh, many of the comments that uh, Councilor Presley has said. And I just wanted to, again, uh, just express that the that many, many levels of which this incredible legislation helps people, documented, undocumented, economically with housing and to make sure that we see that violence is is multifaceted and that it also impacts us in many ways thank you Councilor Edwards um, at this time anyone wishing to add their name uh, madam clerk if you could add you're already on there uh, if you could add Councilor Baker if you could add Councilor Sabi George Councilor Malley Councilor Flaherty Councilor Flynn Councilor Janey Councilor McCarthy Councilor Wu Councilor Zakum as well as the chair um, Councilors Presley and Edwards seek uh, suspension of the rules and adoption of the second late file matter all those in favor say aye, aye. any opposed say nay the ayes have it the second late file matter has been adopted uh, moving on to the third late file matter Councilor Campbell for Council of Presley, orders that are effective Saturday, August 4th. Uh, this, these second, I'm sorry, the third and fourth late file matters are personnel orders, by the way. Uh, Councilor Presley seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket of the late, of the third late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The third late file matter has been passed. In Council, Council Campbell, ordered that effective August 25th, the chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the fourth late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The fourth late file matter has been passed. Uh, moving on to the green sheets. Anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets? Okay, that will just be me at this time. Um, Madam Clerk, I would, as chair of the Committee on Rules and Administration, I would like to remove a matter from the green sheets. It's on page 11 of 13, and it's docket number 1095. Thank you, Madam President. On page 11 of 13, under the Committee on Rules and Administration, docket number 1095, Audit is sponsored by Councilor Zakum. Audit to adopt a discrimination, harassment, and retaliation policy for City Council employees. Filed on July 11, 2018. Any objections to removing this from the green sheets? Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. It's properly before the Council. Um, Councilor Zakum, you have the floor. Sure. Um, well, thank you, Madam President. I want to uh, just thank. Uh, our good colleague, Councilor Presley, uh, who has worked on us with this, and all of our colleagues who have attended with the working sessions uh, and your rules committee hearing, I believe, last week or Th two weeks, right. fairly recently, um, <laughs> to finalize this policy. Uh, there are not significant changes since uh, we introduced it. Uh, I think it's uh, an important step forward for this body, for our employees, visitors, and for ourselves. And I look forward to uh, adding this to the council rules. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakum. Uh, Councilor Presley, would you like to speak on this matter? Uh, thank you. Um, anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Um, at this time, I, I uh, as chair of the Committee on Rules and the Administration, want to thank uh, Councilor Zakum and Councilor Presley for your leadership on this, and also to my colleagues that showed up uh, to the working session um, as well. Um, at this time, um, as chair of the Committee on Rules and the Administration, are looking to take a vote on this. All those in favor of adopting this new policy for the Boston City Council, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Uh, dockets, docket 1095 has been passed. Um, I will just add uh, something that I did say at the um, working session with respect to this policy. Obviously, it's a new policy for the council. Um, we're going to ensure that um, we get folks in here to train each office, not just the councilors, but each office um, in implementation of this policy. So I will work on that and will keep all of my colleagues abreast of when that will actually happen. So thank you. Um, Councilor Sioma? I'm sorry. Uh, I see you rise. Yes, uh, I'd like to um, move to for reconsideration of docket 1203 okay. and the two late files to add my name. For so for docket 1023 as one, well as the two, two late zero, file three, matters. Right. Any objections to reconsidering those three dockets so that Councilor CMO can add his name? Um, no objections of Madam Clerk. If you could add Councilor Siomo to docket 1023. 
that resolution as well as the two late file matters, the hearing order as well as the uh, resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siomo. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, there are two late file matters uh, to add to the consent agenda, which in the absence of objection will be added to the consent agenda. Hearing and seeing no objections, the late file matters are so added. The, the chair at this time moves for adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the consent agenda has been adopted. At this time, I would like to ask all that my, that, oh, never mind. Councilor Sabitra. I ask um, a moment just to address uh, my colleagues uh, regarding one of my uh, interns in my office. Go ahead, Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was wrapping up and got caught off guard at the time. <laughs> I just, uh, today, um, one of my, my Northeastern co-op, Megan Camello from uh, my office, her sister, Jamie, is at Dana-Faba today for her one-year checkup after having a very large brain tumor removed. Wow. And I um, just wanted to take this moment to share that with you and ask you all today if you have a moment uh, throughout the day to just say a quick prayer for Jamie, uh, who hopefully this day will go very smoothly for her. She will be attending Loyola, Loyola in the fall and are in next month in September. And uh, I wish her luck for sure. We're excited to have Megan on our team. Uh, for this semester, but just want to keep Jamie in our thoughts and prayers today. Just want to share that and ask you to do that for me, please. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Councillor Asabi George. Uh, Councillor Baker, for what purpose do you rise? I'm going to make a statement about an unfortunate event. <clears throat> um, yeah, just want to let people know that my Amanda in my office today, her father, Mike Curley, was involved in, a, in an accident. Not really sure what's happening, but he's not doing well. So if you're the type of person to pray, please pray for him. If you don't pray, just send a positive vibe to Mike Curley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Baker. Thank you. Yep. Councilor Janey, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you. Um, just a brief statement about a neighbor who has passed, um, but also mm -hmm. want to offer my prayers for Amanda's father. Yep, go ahead, um, So Jane. we're going to acknowledge uh, this person today. So I've had a, mm -hmm. a, a neighbor that I've known for about 20 years, a dear friend who suddenly passed away, um, is one of those just amazing people in your neighborhood who has been there 50 plus years, saw all of the kids grow up, saw all of their kids grow up in the neighborhood, knew everyone, uh, was raising her granddaughter. Her granddaughter just finished her first year um, of college and has to go back this September without her grandmother who's raising her. Just an amazing woman who often doesn't get the kind of recognition um, here in this kind of body, so I wanted to lift her up uh, and ask that you continue to uh, pray for her family, particularly her, her granddaughter. Um, I, you know, I miss her laughter and her candor uh, and her wit. Um, she was just an amazing person in our neighborhood. Her name is uh, Joan Andrews. So keep uh, the Andrews family in prayer, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Councilor Flynn, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, on the first, um, late file um, submitted by Council Presley and McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Could I respectfully ask that my name be added? For recon um, anyone uh, object to uh, reconsidering that docket, that late file matter, so that Councilor Flynn can add his name? Nope, Madam Clerk, if you could add Councilor Flynn to that hearing order. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And, oh. um, one other issue, Madam President. Yes, if, you can. If I may. Thank you, Madam <laughs> President. Um, after, the, after the hearing, if my I want to ask, respectfully ask if my council colleagues would join the United Steel Workers for a, um, a photo immediately after this. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, I guess we could do the photo in the chamber. And just another quick announcement for all colleagues. Councillor Baker is hosting us for lunch right after uh, the council meeting. So just a friendly reminder to folks who will be in the curly room. Um, at this time, I'd like my colleagues as well as all guests to please rise as we adjourn today's meeting in memory of the following individuals. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, if we could all rise. For Councillor Siomo, Patrick Keneally, Donata Mazzola, and Dorothy Spellman, 
for Councillor Asabi George, Giovanni Desire, and Joan O'Leary. For Councillor Janey, Joan Andrews. For Councillor Flaherty and Flynn, Colin McGrath. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. At this time, the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of those aforementioned individuals. Um, we are scheduled to meet again in this chamber at Boston City Hall on Wednesday, August 22nd at 12 noon in this chamber. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The council is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>